You are listening to Well Met, a Hearthstone podcast brought to you by blizzpro.com. Well Met. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 43 of the Well Met Podcast. We are a Hearthstone podcast brought to you by BlizzPro.com. I'm John Horstman, I push the buttons every week, and of course with me is the crew, first from Saskatoon, Canada, those beautiful rosy red cheeks. You're going to be a Santa Claus, you're going to be a mall Santa Claus someday. It's Kevin Hovdis, dad. I can only be a mall Santa if I grow the beard back, man. It's I got a long ways to go before I'm Santa qualified right now. It will it will not be too long. It will not be too I, long. I know. Actually, that's my great fear is that like I'm going to be 35 and look like Santa Claus. Oh no! Well, you're not graying yet, <laughs> so you're doing okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Across from Kevin, of course, from Kansas City, it's the man, the myth, the legend. It is Jr. Cook. Hey, Jr. I, I should trade shirts with Kevin and my gray hair. So that way he can be Santa Claus. That's so thoughtful of you. <laughs> Why does Santa Claus wear a chief shirt? Because he knows who to root for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hate that your sports teams keep winning because <laughs> you are he's literally, the worst. He's literally he's trying a- to ruin Christmas with this right now. Like, you okay, are the worst stop, winner in stop. the world. I did not bring. I did not bring anything up. About uh, the Chiefs, you did. You, I mean, I you basically did subliminally. I just said red shirt. <laughs> subliminally. Subliminally. Hey, oh man, guys! Episode forty-three. We're seven episodes away from episode fifty. I cannot That's believe so it. Exciting. We've got our midlife crisis going on. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the rest of our lives. But besides that, everything's going great. Welcome to episode forty-three. Hey to everyone in the chat. A uh, couple of quick things here before we jump into what we did this last week. Number one, set your calendars. Jocelyn Moffitt from the Angry Chicken is going to be on the show next week. We're going to hang out, talk about her grind to the legend rank and uh, everything else that she's doing and all that kind of stuff. She's doing full time. I did not know that she's doing full time, like going full time streaming podcaster now. So like she's That's just crazy, all yeah. into it and she's killing it too, which is great. Uh, second thing is, uh, we think we got our Patreon stuff updated, but stay tuned because it might not be updated anymore. Uh, we're so good at this. And last but not least, we got to nail down. It's okay. And last but not least, um, we put up last week's post show on YouTube, uh, where we played a beast hunter deck. And this week we're going to be doing some walkthrough on tempo mage. Kevin's been playing some tempo mage. I've been wanting to learn it. And, uh, Jr has been known to play Hearthstone sometimes, so we're all going to play uh, a little bit of Tempo Mage here after the show. So if you want to come hang out for that, by all means do so, or check the VODs if you're wanting to have a good time or learn how to play the deck. So, uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about our weeks. Uh, Kevin, how'd your week go, man? Well, I mean, I had good news and then I had bad news. I started off trying to learn uh, Tempo Mage. There was a really good list from uh, the competitive Hearthstone subreddit that was going around. Zandalay put a list together that really focused on uh, using Arcane Blast. Super good list. Had a ton of fun with it. Cruised straight from, honestly, like rank 14 right up to rank 5. And then I started messing around trying to figure out what deck I might try to keep going with from 5 upwards and just backslid horribly. I tried like Tempo Mage, Reno Lock, a little bit of Rogue, some Patron Warrior, like, and, and nothing stuck. I'm back down to like the bottom of like rank 8, top of rank 9. I don't even remember. Wow. I, just, I lost a ton. It was awful. Dude. I think I just I got crazy tilted and I should have stopped. I should have walked away and I just didn't. And that's what happens, right? So Did you keep your stats... Um climbing up do you know how many times you lost no i don't think it was very many like my my gut is is that i probably only lost maybe five or six because the win streaks were super significant but um and and it felt really good to be like uh, it was like a week into the season i'm sitting at rank five already looking at the legend climb thinking like yeah this feels really good and now i'm back down and it like like, not like it's hard to get back well it's not like it's hard to get back from eight to five right i mean that's that's like 
12 games if you're on a win streak or something if that like it's not bad but i just need to get i need to find another deck that sits well with me and get back into it i do all my eight foot eight to five climbs in 12 wins so there just, you go i just win streak it there just don't lose it's, it's that easy the plan, guys. right <laughs> this yeah. is how we help you become a better hearthstone player just don't if you lose less you'll win more yep that's true that's that's a true statement and what thank you that's definitely what to live by and also remember that if you don't play the game you can't lose just kidding that's the worst ever <laughs> that's the worst that's the jr strategy that's the jr <laughs> <laughs> oh man it's just going around tonight jr how was your week in hearthstone man it's funny that kevin says that because that's probably how my week went <laughs> oh no, no, I've been playing uh I've been playing uh druid uh like token token druid with double combo. Um just playing like one uh, uh power of the wild, uh play the living roots, uh just have a lot of sticky minions on the board and just go for the combo, go for the win. Uh it, it I've been playing it since the beginning of this month and it's gotten me to rank 9 so far. Um, I haven't made the push that I would like to yet. Uh, I would have liked to have been ranked five by now, um, but I just didn't have a chance to play as much this week. Um, but the deck's deck's pretty solid. I mean, any mid rangey druid deck is gonna win you games, <laughs> in my opinion. So as long as uh, as long as you know uh, uh, how to, as long as you come across opponents that don't know how to get around the combo, let's say, which is actually quite a few. Or they don't have the tools to try to avoid it at that that point in time, but uh, so that's what I did. So how you about you count done? to fourteen? <laughs> uh, you right? would be surprised. Like it's true. I had a warlock that was at sixteen, and I had combo in my hand with two cards, and I've had these two cards in my hand the whole time. And he decided to you know draw a card, and I'm like, okay, I guess I get a win next turn. Cool. There was a couple I mean, times though it that. Happens. I- yeah, there was a couple times where I was like, oh, da 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 da, going on, like, oh crap, I'm at 13. I'm dead. I'm just dead. I just took a little too much face damage and now I'm an idiot. Well, so, it gets to a point, right, where you can't play around every possible line of play. Like, he's tapping, fishing for whatever answer he has to keep him in the game, whether it's a Lothab or a Reno or whatever. Like, it, it happens to the best of us. I've been on the receiving end of one too many of those druid combos and it's, it's rough, right? Like, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, you asked. I think it's down to the point where it's like do or die anyway. I mean, might as well take the chance, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's if you're in a like tap or lose situation, that's what you got to do. I know yeah. you had asked how my week was, and so I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Normally, I get to play some Hearthstone during the week, and then sometimes I got to take one for the team and not get to play really any Hearthstone this week. So. Uh, I had Casey come into the studio this week. We did some recording yeah. uh, for some new stuff. Sounds amazing, by the way. I've got just a whole bunch of footage to put together. I've been editing that almost nonstop. I'm about five or six hours into it already, and I've probably got another five or six hours to go um, before I get everything to a point to where maybe we'll have some cool new sounds and sounders and stuff on the show. So not a lot of Hearthstone this week, which is why post-show we're playing on my account. That's super cool, though, that you are getting all that stuff done. I know that, like, A, I've been super excited about that ever since we announced it as a possible Patreon goal and to actually, like, clear it and have actually got the recording and stuff now. Like, I'm I'm super jazzed just to update the show and give it, you know, some new options. Not that the good stuff we have now doesn't kick ass, but, like, it's cool, right? It's super cool to have a range of new material. And, and this, is, this is something that we've been talking about for months. Right. Yeah. No, I'm I'm pretty excited about it. I I love I love getting that new stuff, hearing the new stuff, and just uh, hearing it and listening to it because John knows some really talented people. More totally, talent, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know one one day I'll be that talent. I just get to record the talent, I guess. Yeah, I guess you do know us. So, yeah. hey man, oh my god, what, whatever whatever you're doing is wizardry compared to what we know. So, <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> Guys, shut up. Let's go to the news. This Week in Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft. 
Ah, uh, yes, the Hearthstone news. Uh, fairly slow week in Hearthstone as far as new goes, but news goes. But we did have a couple new things come out. Uh, first and foremost, we did get the December 2015 uh, ranked play final rankings came out for all the different regions. Uh, in America is number one, Fibonacci, number two, Navi Oot, and number three, Muzzy, which is pretty cool. In Europe, n- number one, not going to even pretend to try to, to translate that. Number two, Jackie Chan, and number three, Crane333. So a um, couple of, if, if you follow the America scene at all, all those names should at least look familiar. And then Jackie Chan I'm familiar with. I have not heard of the number one or crane three, three, three in, uh, in Europe, but overall pretty exciting stuff. Uh, did you guys notice anything kind of cool or exciting or interesting about these last month's rank? Besides that, it seems to be a lot of new players that I haven't really recognized before, which is pretty neat. Well, I think it's cool. At Fibonacci, I, it was pointed out on Twitter by Robert, uh, Robert wing, uh, the Fibonacci has been number one in North America like four times in the last year now, which is crazy to think of because that's not an easy thing to get. And I, I made the really bad joke because because he was saying how impressive it was for him to hit number one four times. I made the really, really bad joke that would have been more impressive if he had uh, uh, ranked one, one, three, five, eight, thirteen. That's yeah. awful. That's <laughs> awful. Ooh. Math jokes. We're making math jokes now. That's what I got we've it. come to. I got right. it. Well, it was cool, yeah, because Fibonacci, he's made the top 100, I think, five times, and of them three, he's been in first, I believe, because it was like 60% of the time if he makes the list, he's in first, was the stat that was quoted, which is crazy. Uh, oh, yeah, also, I said like, four. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Lots of super uh, memorable names at the top of the America's list outside that top three as well. Like I know, uh, John, you've been singing Amnesiac's praises forever, and he 11. was in like, yeah, I was like just outside top ten, which is crazy. Like super good placement for him, so that's really exciting. I, I saw lots of names on there that I would really love to see score a few points and get a shot at the uh, the like first seasonal championship, which is going to come up fast. Like last year, you really didn't have to think about it until we got to almost BlizzCon time. But this year, like we hit the first BlizzCon qualifiers, the first big major tournament in March. We're going to have the winter championships in March. So we've only got like, honestly, what, eight weeks? Another, yep. another two months of ranked play before we're already at the first big championship of the year in the Hearthstone scene. I want to go back for one second, too. Do you guys know what deck Fibonacci used? Kevin, you're going to love this. I assume Secret Paladin. Control Warrior. No way. Yes, sir. Wow. Um, that is impressive. I mean, it, it is technically a good play in the meta right now with how fast Freeze Mage is rising, but, like, wow. It's not number one, though. The guy is just a Control Warrior god is really what it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to tech it really smart. You have to really want to play it. But even still, like, that's crazy. That blows me away. Yeah, so that's pretty amazing. So kudos to that person, and I cannot wait for uh, these winter championships. It's going to be really sweet to see. I'm going to get my one point. I can't remember who did it. Uh, and it, This was a long time ago. JR, you might remember this. When they used to do uh, these top ladder rankings, it may not have actually even been a Blizzard official thing. It might have been somebody like Liquid Hearth that did it, but they used to get a list from each of the players in the top, like, 20 or 30 and just ask them like what deck were you running and i remember this because i remember it was the like beginnings of people freaking out back in like late 2013 about miracle rogue because they published that list of like these are the top 20 people these are the decks they were laddering with to get to this rank and like i remember that we're running miracle Rogue. yeah i missed that i really wish that like blizzard would reach out to maybe even the top 10 and just say what deck were you playing because then they could publish that and it would be super interesting information to have yeah I would like to see Otherwise, that. It's kind of we're stuck trying to get it third party, and I know that probably there's a community like site out there that could do it. I mean, it, hell, if we really wanted to, we could do it, right? But that would be a lot of work. I know a lot of it too, though, especially at that high end. Like you always have the option to like outskill your opponents, which you know we all know is sure. is a difference of like one percent skill, you know, type thing, or to surprise your opponents. And sometimes players don't want you to know that because they found a deck that's really anti-meta and uh, they're going to keep winning with it. I know uh, uh, Tempo Cyan was doing this with uh, Camel Hunter before people started running Camel Hunter. 
Uh, he was up into the top 10 with that. And um, he gave me the deck list. He's like, don't give anybody this. It's not ready yet and do anything like that. And then with like about a week after he had kind of played it out, he went ahead and published it and goes, hey, check this guy. Check this out. So I know a lot of the pro players like to do that, too, is kind of run the ladder through and kind of reap the benefits of creating something new and super anti meta. And then, you know, then let the rest of the uh, scene play with it a little bit. So yeah, that might usually, be a reason too. That's usually a huge thing uh, in uh, tournaments because you don't want want the other people to know what you're going to be playing or uh, what you're going to be teching or what what you're toying with. Uh, at least early in Hearthstone tournaments, because I remember Forsen uh, when he was really big into the tournaments in the early beta, he would never publish his deck list, and everybody else would. After, and that was before, you know, you had tournaments with everything always. Uh, uh, on live streamed and everything. It's when they're still being played, uh, just right. person to person, then, you know, relaying the, uh, wins. The flip side to that too, though, is that we're talking end of season, right? Like usually whatever benefit they're going to get out of these decks by the time they've hit, you know, rank two, uh, for December in this case, right. They're, they're probably done what they're going to do with that list. And I don't know. I just think it was cool to have that knowledge of what classes were popular at that end of the spectrum but oh totally yeah totally totally agree with you there i just i get why a lot of them don't want to do that yeah I, I would be surprised if there was about half the people on the list who's like no please don't do that even for small yeah. tech choices you know like and that's a lot of time what it what it is uh just like ost kaka and hoy had their secret paladin list and uh, if you got onto that secret paladin list the first couple days it was there uh, it oh, raised no. your, yeah. I mean, that's the, when I went from rank 14 to rank four and literally I think two losses, uh, and it was just those little tech things. Right. And so, um, that's really important too, even if it's just, you're teching in a black knight or you got gorilla in your warrior deck or whatever, like those are things that are a big deal in this game, which is kind of insane. It's true. Let's go ahead and talk about the uh, Gosu Gamers Hearthstone Awards, though. So Gosu Gamers every year, or at least last year, last year, they uh, come out with their Hearthstone Awards, where uh, they go ahead and uh, a panel of experts goes ahead and votes on different kind of award topics, as well as uh, fans do, too. So there's also fans' choice as well. Um, there's all sorts of really, uh, really good different... Um, Categories, there we go. Categories like Player of the Year, Breakout Player of the Year, Biggest Potential of 2016, Team of the Year, and Best New Caster. So uh, those are some of them, but there's quite a few more too, so you should definitely check that out. It's in the show notes for you. Um, let's go ahead and talk through some of these. So Player of the Year, uh, obviously the big award for sure, goes to G2 Tice. So... I'm not surprised, and I don't even think I could for a second really uh, say differently. Like, it's just obvious that he was the player of the year. He owned, especially the second half of 2015, so well and played really well in the first half. So there's just nobody who played better Hearthstone than him, unless one of you disagree with me. No, I, I it totally... I, and just think he was basically one turn away from ending up probably winning the world championship too. So. Yeah. And, and played really smart Hearthstone, which I think is, you know, everybody can be like a big fan of the guy. I know he's crazy polite, super amicable, like just a nice guy. But for me, like watching him play the analytic level at which he was playing those games just boggled me. Like I, I don't think I'll ever have the patience to play at the caliber of like decision making that watch like watching him play. You're just like you can see him running through every card in every possible combination and permutation in both decks. Like it's nuts. I love the guy. And interesting too, this was also uh, the fan vote as well. It wasn't just the pro vote; it was the fan vote as well. It was for yep. And I think that was a pretty easy one. Yeah, it was pretty pretty obvious when there's that much unit uh, like of a unanimous decision. Right. Right. Uh, breakout player of the year goes to uh, Ostkaka of Navi. So another one where guy who wasn't world champion and now is world champion, that's kind of a breakout, I guess you would say. So 
that makes sense. I think there are some players where I would say maybe had more of a year. I would say Kranich would be one of those players where even though he made it in the top eight last year, like he really didn't do anything until this year. So he had an amazing 2015. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if I would, I don't know anyone else besides Ostkaka that you would think. I mean, Oskaka was the obvious one, and I think the correct choice. Um, there's strong argument to be made for Purple as well. Um, Purple kind of didn't do a whole lot until 2015 in terms of results, and then blew up, and all of a sudden he's the America's champion or second place. I can't remember. Did he win in America's? I, I can't remember if it form. was him or Hot Form. I've, yeah. Anyway, they both yeah, did phenomenally well. Four, so. Yeah, they both carried really well, and I, like he was a real strong asset to the Americas region. So he w- and he was second place, I think, uh, in the Community Choice Awards for this one. So he was, he was first too, number thirty-one percent of the vote for Community Choice. Oh, you're looking at Oskaka. I was saying Purple was the runner-up. Oh, that. Purple, Purple, got it. Yeah. Okay, and I was like, what? Um, oh, and I, I guess too, I, I didn't miss this the first time. Stan Sifka was the runner up, which I would totally, I would actually totally agree with that. Um, Oskaka and Stan Sifka, definitely huge 2015s. So, yeah. Uh, biggest potential for 2016. This one, <laughs> no, JR, no, it is not you. You can keep pointing at yourself. <laughs> You can keep doing that, and maybe like some people, it's like you just keep saying something until it becomes true. I've been there before, uh, but I no, mean, I don't <laughs> think you can argue with me having the biggest potential next year or this year. Like most room for improvement, sure, yeah, it's true. The most improved <laughs> award, maybe that's true. There I'll take go. it. <laughs> it's an award, um, but uh, b- biggest potential for 2016 Super JJ. Uh, you don't hear a whole lot from Super JJ. It has a fairly successful stream. Sits right between the 300 and kind of 650 people range. Does pretty well. He's got a lot of like third and fourth place finishes. Not a lot of one and two. A lot of smaller tournaments, but really turned it off on this or turned it up on the second half of the year. And then the runner up here, is Surrender. Uh, and this. If I didn't know about him going into like November, I would have said no way, but it's probably pretty accurate. So again, I think they did a really good job with this list and Super JJ taking 42% of the community choice vote as well, which is pretty amazing. I think I know how he did it because he has the name Super in front of his name, JJ. So I'm going to change my name to Super JR. Super JR. So that way, Stupid biggest JR. potential for 2017 will be mine. Super JJ wins 2016. I'll win 2017. Not gonna it does, happen. I think, bear mentioning at this point as we're going down this list, this is a super Western-centric list of people. Like, this is 100% like it's an English site with English voting happening primarily based out of English-speaking countries. So no, like we're not talking a lot about what's happening for like breakout players or like up and comers coming out of Asia Pacific or China. Like I would have loved to have seen like pimping ho show up on here or phone tap or somebody, but like, no, we're talking very specifically about some pretty recognizable, like you could call them on the phone and talk to them type of people. It means that they speak English as one of their language is. Yeah. Is is basically saying. the like the strong. <laughs> He's saying I think it real polite and Canadian like, but it that's wasn't what he like means. an exclusion for the list. But <laughs> it feels as you go down it, you're like, oh, is that another white guy? Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go into team of the year then. So team of the year, this one's obvious. Kevin, Kevin, who who's team of the year? Uh, without question, it's G two. Yeah. Today. There's just no debate to be had there. I mean, they they picked up four of the best players in the world after they got together and formed a team that didn't exist even a few months prior uh, that turned around and, like, has the, uh, like, near to world champion class players all the way across the board, one ATLC. I, how do you choose anybody else, really? Like, I, yep. what what other team even put up noteworthy results as a team this year? 
I mean, in in like the Asia Pacific China stuff, uh, Team Celestial did, but even then, they have like nine people on their roster. Like they're huge. This well, is... they're the only like core like organization within Hearthstone coming out of China right now. Everybody right. else is just individual players or like individually right. sponsored for the most part. And like these are three guys, four if you count Lothar, but he's really more of a personality. Even though he plays great Hearthstone, he's very good, but he's just gone to like the management. I think he does talent acquisition now, right? Or talent management for G2, something like that. Something like that. Um, so he does that. And then, of course, you've got Life Coach, RDU, and Tice, which um, if you follow the esports or the Hearthstone esports scene, um, you've definitely heard of all three of those. So, yeah, incredible team. And, yeah, not even close anywhere else. Uh, they had over 50% of the vote from the Community Choice Awards. So, uh, that Rough too. Pretty... Timing wise, now they got Lothar hospitalized as well. You guys heard about that? Yeah, I heard about that. That was a. That was a really. I, I was trying to be really sensitive, so I didn't like read too much on it. I just. I hear he's doing much better now, and we're yeah, really glad that he he's okay. Yeah, his wife and he's okay, and everything's fine. Speculation is maybe he had like a seizure, but it sounds like right. he's going to be just fine. That's good. That's good. I like Lothar. His uh, he does some amazing cosplays on his stream. Yeah, those he did are a life coach. If you ever get a chance, go back and watch Lothar's life coach, uh, cosplay sc- uh, stream because it is the funniest thing ever. Like the I turned it on the first time and it's turn one and he's sitting there in the life coach, um, his you know the life coach stands like the hen. turn <laughs> one. He's got tools. no play to make, and then it starts to rope and he goes. Oh, I know. On turn five, we'll play Lotheb. End turn. <laughs> like he's like, it's turn one. It's just amazing. Oh, so you need to go ahead and uh, watch it because it is so uh, so funny. Uh, we're gonna go down here. Um, there are some things like uh, the transfer coup of the year, uh, which Navi being founded is kind of a big deal. Navi's done really well. Rivalry of the year as far as like decks with. Um, most memorable tournament, uh, which BlizzCon World Championship won, which uh, I still liked ATLC. ATLC was my highlight of competitive Hearthstone this year. ATLC, I think, would have been the better event if people could have attended it. Like, it just wasn't, it didn't have the same vibe as a big live tournament. Yeah, that's true. It was definitely more of a, like, a house cup type feel. Yeah. Uh, I want to jump down to this one, though. Best new caster analyst. Raynad coming in number one. JR snarls. Kevin chuckles. I like it. I don't I know a lot of people don't like Raynad. I know he's a really controversial person, but when he gets outside of himself for just a little bit and talks about Hearthstone and uses his brain, I think he's I think he's freaking brilliant. It's why Tempo Storm is a successful organization so far. And because uh, the guy knows relatively what he's doing what he's talking about he just has to put that to the side a little bit i think but i also think it, i would have chose kibler and see that's the thing right for me is like number one uh if you set aside Raynad's personality yes absolutely he is a phenomenally good caster he's analytical he's brilliant um he just talks very smart very eloquently uh i would be thrilled to see him continue to cast in the pro scene for a very long time but he does have kind of a like even in the article it says he's a divisive figure and i think that's pretty accurate um but the, i mean my number two reason i would have preferred to see this done differently is yeah kibler like i would have loved to have seen kibler get it because i just prefer the way that he interacts with other people when he's up there and and the way that he actually kind of plays around with it has a little more fun has a little bit more of a like spin and an angle and he's very very particular when you listen to him cast like he's very conscious not to you know downplay someone's decision making or say what they made a mistake like he's very i would say generous in evaluating possibilities and trying to give people like the benefit of the doubt which makes for a better cast like nine times out of ten that just sounds better than being like oh that's an error like he's just like listing off all the possible ways that that could work out and just stays really upbeat and interacts way better with the people around him like Raynad is in that screen talking to the cards and i i mean i know he's right when he says stuff i just don't like listening to it 
Yeah, I wish he would. If he would focus on it and make that like one of his focuses, I think he would be incredible. But he's still he's, yeah, just play around, banter with your other casters, like have a little bit more stage presence. Jr., how do you feel? Uh, no, I think what Kevin <laughs> said right there is my biggest problem with Hearthstone shoutcasting is there's not enough of what he just said. There's not enough banter. There's not enough working off your your co-host and things like that. Instead, they get these live popular live streamers that have a little bit of a personality, but really not much, in my opinion, to go out there and really cast a tournament. Um, uh, you know, they have they have the personality within themselves to, you know, talk to the screen, right? But they don't have that personality to interact with their co-hosts. And I, I think that's a big thing that's missing from Hearthstone. I think Kibler does it fairly well. Um, that's why I would agree with Kevin that I would have had him up there. Um, but some of the others, like Raynad and Amaz and those guys, I, I just, I personally just cannot stand listening to them cast. That's just me. You know, it's it's interesting because I compare Hearthstone to all of the other esports that I've followed over the years, and the biggest difference I've noticed is that if you go back into like old school pro StarCraft, pro shooters pro MOBAs, like they tend to bring on people that have big personalities and are good enough at the game to give good analysis without it needing to be flawless. Uh, and then if they want like to sit down with a pro who was eliminated earlier in the tournament after a match and have them give analysis for a couple minutes, they bring them in and they get that like pro perspective and they add some serious like, okay, I know what I'm talking about. Let me lay down the law here on the couch. But they don't have them sit and cast the whole game because listening to that for 20 or 30 minutes can get for a fan who isn't super keyed into the high-level decision-making and just wants to have fun enjoying the tournament, it can be a little stale. And I do understand that, like, I love listening to Raynad's analysis, but I would totally prefer to listen to it as post-game analysis rather than overlaid on top of the game as I watch it. Yep, that's 100% how I feel. Okay, fine. But for sure, Reyna did a great job this year. Like, I'm not taking anything away from this award. No, he deserves I, it. I totally know what way. you're saying. Yeah, and sure. And we, I think we look at it a little bit differently too, because we are pretty invested into Hearthstone. <laughs> we kind of spend a lot of time talking about it, and so mm-hmm. you know what we look for in a Hearthstone analyst or caster may be different than what you know, 90% of other people do who don't have 10 hours a week to play the game and talk about it for three hours every week and sleep about it and dream about it and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, like that's always different too. I, yeah, I actually might be a little biased <laughs> just because we put in on that Hearthstone caster thing that we still haven't heard anything about. True. I want to hear, I want to hear John and Kevin. I want to hear you and I, Kev, put us on the caster desk. I think we'd have fun. A oh, man can dream. That would be fun. I, and I might be biased as well because I, I actually really liked what Robert Wing did this year, uh, to be honest. Like, I really thought true. he did a great job of interacting with the others and putting out little funny jokes and things like that. I thought he did a great job. I would have loved to have seen him up here. I feel he like a, the award for that Bob Roth thing alone. I, I, <laughs> I feel like a jerk because I would 100% put Robert up there as my number one or two. Because like, Honestly, I, I think he gets it, and I, I really like. I really appreciated what he did, and uh, I think being kind of one of the assistant community managers, like he understands what the team or what the the game needs and the scene needs, and I think he really brought some really cool stuff there. So, well, I mean, as a CM, like he's his whole job is what does the community want? How do we make sure that we have good PR? How do we have good outreach to our fans? Like. Of course, if you're thinking about that and working on that constantly, that's going to put you in a great place to be up on a desk talking to 100,000 Hearthstone fans all at once. Like That's, that's the ideal way to build a, a sense of how you should be investing yourself into the role that you're about to take when you go up there. Yeah, totally. So there you have it, guys. Your Gosu Gamers 2015 Best in Hearthstone Award, something like that. Whatever they called it. Yeah, they just called it the Gosu Gamer Awards. So there you go. The Gosu Awards 2015 for Hearthstone. <laughs> there it is. Eventually, if I stutter through it enough, I'll find it on the page. Uh, let's go ahead and talk meta. Beat up or join up. Ah, oh, no. So meta this week. We do not have a Liquid Hearth report. I'm beginning to wonder if we'll ever see it again. Um, but before we jump into Tempo Storm, we did want to talk briefly about kind of a cool meta topic that has emerged, uh, and will prove itself relevant here in a few minutes. Um, 
Hearthhead put out a, a question after they'd seen a lot of interaction with some of the pros and uh, Iskar, one of the developers on Hearthstone, on Twitter, asking, should the Druid combo be nerfed? And there's been a lot of conversation about this, um, not because it's particularly like better or worse than any other mechanic in the game right now, but just because it's something that a lot of pros are talking about and they're finding it really frustrating to play against, specifically. Um, and I think it really didn't, it didn't show itself to the level that it's appearing now until after Emperor Thorason. So there's lots of people. Uh, Zixo has been very vocal in saying that it needs to change. Uh, and he's talked a fair bit with Iskar. Uh, that's admirable. Has some issues with the way that it works. Like there's been lots of people who have commented on it. So before we dive into the Tempo Storm report, guys, Druid combo. Love it, hate it, want to see it change. JR. Uh, I don't see anything inherently wrong with the Druid combo at all to be honest, uh, as two very separate cards, like, I don't want to see either one of them get nerfed is the problem because on their own, they're okay. Like, it, it's, like, I might need that force of nature early on without the Savage Roar, and uh, it's a good card to be able to clear stuff if I need to. Um, whereas Savage Roar, if I'm playing a uh, Token Druid or something like that, that I get stuff early on the board, it's a really powerful card early game to kind of get things going. Um, so the problem really is the two in conjunction, but I think they're both, I think the mana on them both is fine. Um, it's one of those things where you just got to know, you know, turn nine, coming up turn nine, unless they're lucky and have some innervates and things like that, you want to be, if they have two cards, you want to be 14 health or above. And uh, I know that, you know that, John knows that, we all know that, so knowing that, is, it, I... I don't think it's that it's it's not a surprise, right? And that's part of the problem, like Patron Warrior and stuff like that. It came out as a surprise because everything suddenly came out, bam, you're dead. Uh, Druid, you know exactly when that's going to hit. So I don't think it's that big of a problem. That's fair, John. What do you think? Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. First and foremost, no, I I don't believe it should be nerfed. Uh, there's a few reasons as to why. Number one. Uh, without it, Druid is a fairly weak class. Like, there's not really much they have to build around, and they'd have to do a lot of work to make that work. And I know they want Beast Druid to happen, but it's not happening so far, so uh, they would need to work on fixing that part out. Um, the second thing is, is that Druid has always been strong, mid-range Druid. Um, Thorson gave it a nice little bump, but even then, like, not a whole lot of, not every druid runs Thorson anymore. I'd say it's in about 75% of the mid-range druid decks, and so, um, it's just a really strong deck, but it also is the only way druid has to get you through that last 10 damage. And that's the big thing I see with druid, is druid can deal 20 damage pretty easy with the cards it has. But if you take Savage Roar or the Savage Roar combo, um, you basically it's going to be very difficult to do that last ten damage. And so I don't know. And personally, it's foreseeable. It reminds me of Handlock. It's almost like saying Handlock should be nerfed, um, just because uh, if you don't play around uh, Molten Giants and Taunts correctly, you lose. And it's like, well, it's kind of the same thing. If you don't play around combo correctly, you lose. Uh, this is a really consistent deck, and I think this is maybe the most consistent deck we have ever seen that is uh, mainstayed in so many metas. It's never got out of Tier 2, to my understanding, since meta reports have been around and that deck came around. So, no, I think it's fine. Um, I think it's strong. I don't think it should get any more uh, decks that buff that, but uh, or make that, uh, or any more cards, sorry, that make that combo is stronger. I think they need to be careful with that as they intro introduce new cards like Thorson. But overall, I think it's great. I think, it, I think it's a great combo. I think it's healthy for the game. I mean, really, what it comes down to is it's 14 points of damage. That's a little less than half your life. So really, the, the main thing is, how are they getting that 16 points of damage to begin with? Uh, you know, or, or a little bit over. Uh, so the fact is that Druid just... It, it, Druid just uh, curves out, can curve out really, really well, and curve out really, really fast. And that's probably the actual, like, 
quote unquote problem with Druid. I don't think it's combo. I think it's just the fact that everything curves out, you know, almost perfectly with Druid a lot of the times. Maybe. I mean, uh, so I'll, I'll weigh in and I guess uh, I liked the rat's take on it, which was that they're dead cards until you have the ability to, to win with them. So you basically, by running them in your deck, you have to leave them sitting in your hand as dead draws, which is kind of the trade-off to running the combo. And I think there's some validity to that. Or the definition uh, of a combo, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, generally. Um, the other thing, I though, that I think is worth mentioning is this, for me, is a pretty clear statement, once again, that the most problematic mechanic in the game is charge. Um, no one is complaining about Savage Roar because, frankly, if Savage Roar was the problem, so like this, you'd have the exact same problem with Bloodlust, right? Bloodlust would be winning games left, right, and center, and it's not. <laughs> it's just impossible for it to be relevant in the same way because Druid can throw down Force of Nature. So I think Charge is what's really causing the problem. And from my perspective, I I don't know that it needs a big change, but I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't complain necessarily if they changed Force of Nature to say like summon two three three treants. That would cut combo to twelve instead of fourteen, and it would mean you had one less way to burst through a taunt. It would be one less body, um, so you'd need to have some sticky minions on the board. Which right now, that's generally how combo gets pulled off. Right, is on the basis of something surviving from a raptor or a shredder or a whatever. I don't know. I it's probably not going anywhere, but it's an interesting conversation. What what is a combo without charge? I mean, I think there's been plenty of combos without charge. I think Miracle Rogue, Freeze Mage, like any deck that has to save a bunch of pieces up to pull something off is the definition of that. I mean, those are spells. They're not really, but I guess so are Force of Nature and Savage Roar. So. Kind of, but it's it's yes, it's there's spell. spells, but I mean, you know, you're, you're playing things on the board without charge. Yeah. Yeah, you just, still yeah, put out just, the I mean, on a ton of spells. For the most part, if there if there's not a way for you to attack and do damage with something on that turn, like it's it's really difficult. Like I totally get what you're saying, but I worry that by nerfing this too, we start to remove, you know, to Firebat's point, we start to remove the combo the mechanic from the games, yeah. and all of a sudden it's I played a better three drop than you did. I win. Like that, that feels awful. That's horrible for the game. I would rather yeah, have less, one less ways to play from behind. And I would rather yeah. have people just start running low theb again and not throwing it down on turn five every time than it would be, you know, than, you know, nerfing this combo. So, okay. This brings up a, a thing that I kind of like danced around bringing up, but I do kind of think is interesting. What's the least used mechanic in Hearthstone? Jousting? Nope. I mean, I mean, physically, like least printed mechanic. It's counter. Uh, there's silence? actually a counter mechanic. No, there's oh, a counter mechanic. Counter. It's only on counter spell. I think there's maybe room to put more stuff in the game that has counter. Because if you could counter charge by putting out like a secret or counter, um, you know, I, there's lots of ways. Because all counter says is it prevents the effect of a card from occurring, right? And there's lots of ways that you could make that interesting and add ways to sort of prevent these combo heavy decks from pulling off these impossible turns or just, you know, counter the next card played before a paladin drops their mysterious challenger, right? Like there'd be lots of ways to make some new stuff workable. I don't know how fair it would feel or how expensive it would have to be, but I wonder if that's not how they get around this is instead of nerfing a whole bunch of cards and trying to find clever solutions to like, what did we do with Thoris on? Do we have to change him? Blah, blah, blah. Like just allow us to counter things outright. Cause that's, that's really one of the huge weaknesses of the game is I feel like I can't even put down a wall of taunts cause it's just going to get silenced and run over anyway. Like we're running out of ways to keep ourselves alive in situations where we're already trying to like regain control in a game that we're losing. I think like a creature that has that ability on it would be kind of cool. Like, but I'm not sure how Hearthstone would handle that because you can have it as, say, like, counter the next spell that your opponent casts, but is it a battle cry and it stays Well, then that's just counter spell. Or is it, it something that stays out there and isn't activated until, you know, you have to kill the creature first? Um, and then it, that, that effect goes away. Like an inspire um, effect. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, yeah, there, there sure definitely inspired. are... It's, it's tough because the only way to do it now is a secret, and I think that's very intentional because of the fact that there is no way to play on your opponent's turn. 
There, I mean, there there are ways where it's like you could do a low theb where next turn your opponent can only play one card. Uh, that could be kind of neat. Awful! Oh my god! I mean, but I mean, it's basically low theb. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, it's really yeah. what it is, you know, and so like there are a lot of ways that you can counter these uh, combo decks. And part of it is maybe you shouldn't be able to like maybe your counter is controlling the board, you know, having us, you know, all you need is a sludge belcher on turn nine. Um, all you need is a taunt. All you need is something there and they have to go and work for it. But I mean, at, the, at the end of the day, it has to be something more than a secret because then only one class is going to get it. I don't know if you want to direct counter to combos. Like, I mean, yes, you should have a way to defend yourself and you should have a way to be able to win against combos. I, you know, example, see Grim Patron Warrior and why it was nerfed. But there yeah. are a lot of very, very um, act, proactive things that you can do against Druid. Um, maybe yeah. at not like the highest, highest, highest end of gameplay where, you know, you're Zixo and you play Druid flawlessly. And so if you get your combo, you win. If you don't get your combo, you lose. But at the same time, like, then don't run a combo deck. Like, that's kind of the, that's like saying Miracle Rogue isn't good if you don't get your finisher. Like, duh. That's why you have Gadget Sand Auctioneer and you draw 26 cards in four turns so you can get that. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't mean, know. there's plenty of ways to beat Druid, right? Because when, when you know their combo's coming, you can drop down Lotheb as a tech choice. Uh, you can play Sludge Belchers and wait until late turns to drop those down. And they have trouble dealing any kind of taunts they have trouble dealing with. Yeah, they have two silences in their deck, but they might have used them already. Or they, they can only cast one, you can and play next face turn they have to wait for a combo, so you play another taunt down and be like, deal with it, sucker. You can just play face hunter. Or you can yeah, that's play you something it. stupid like face hunter. Kill him by turn eight. Turn nine. Duh. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> Point made. Combo druid's probably not going anywhere. I just thought it was a super interesting question to ask, and there's lots of people weighing in. Right now, it's really hot in the community. I know. Part of, <laughs> Even part our of chat the room. It's hot. Oh, yeah, lit up like the 4th of July in there. It's great. Uh, part of the reason that's so big is because, drum roll please, Temple Storm meta snapshot number Sorry. 43 is out, and the top deck of the game right now is mid range druid. Woo! No shock there in a lot of ways. I think it's been a long time coming. It's like druid has been number one a couple of times in recent memory. Uh, I want to say. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's just been sitting at, like, number two forever. But it's been right up there forever, just, like, trading back and forth with Secret Paladin for who's at the very top, uh, other than the few brief weeks where Temple Storm pretended that Aggro Shaman <laughs> was the number one deck. You notice it disappeared, hey? Like, it showed up for, like, three weeks and then fell right back to, like, is it Sixth even Sixth deck in the game. Yeah, it's still top of tier yeah, two. It's, it's in tier two, but, like, yeah, it just disappeared where it right out of there. Probably <laughs> where, where it belongs. belongs. Yeah. But anyway, so mid-range druid at number one, secret paladin at number two, Zulok flying up to number three, amazing because of the amount of druid and freeze mage scooting up to number four, probably in direct response. Well, and tempo to, mage too. Yeah, in direct response to all the zoo and all the secret paladins. So mage looking really good right now. Druid looking really good right now. Um, what do you guys think? Like these ranks look pretty accurate to me. Mm. I think this is one of the best lists that uh, Tempest Storm has put together in a while. It doesn't feel so flavor of the monthy with like, you know, this deck's hot, everyone run on it, and things like that. Um, yeah, I would say I would say the, the top four tier one decks right there are the decks I almost always see on the ladder right now. Like, I hardly ever see anything else except these. Yeah. I mean, I would say if you keep going down the list, like I still see lots of Tempo Mage, lots of Aggro Shaman, lots of Reno Lock. Those are the next things in order on the list. Uh, after that, it sort of starts to fizzle out. You get into like Patron Warrior, Priest, Control, uh, or you know, Oil Rogue is in there. Old school Aggro Druid, which I don't, I don't think I've seen a legit Aggro Druid, like a Fell Reaver Aggro Druid in, I couldn't tell you how long now. Yeah. So, but I, it feels like it's a really accurate representation of what's on the ladder today. Although at rank eight. Uh, uh, last week or something like that. Uh, no, it was this week. Uh, I played a rogue pirate deck against a rogue pirate deck and got beat, and that's why I cried myself at night that night because I got beat by a rogue pirate deck. I died to a Murloc Shaman deck, and I just about uninstalled the game. <laughs> 
was bad. But yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Like, is there anything? Is there anything that's really like crazy wrong with this list? You think? Like, I don't know if I would put Dragon Priest at sixteen. You think it deserves to be a tier two? I think it does. I, I think it does well enough against a lot of these a little bit faster decks uh, with those early taunts. Um, what would, I mean, the, the problem with this, though, is that like Temple Storm traditionally doesn't want to overload any one tier, right? So you'd have to bump something else from tier two. So what do you bump? Do you bump like Malilock or Aggro Druid? I would bump Malilock out of any of them. You could bump, just, you could bump I that. Don't I don't think it. you could bump. I don't see it hardly at all. I don't think you could bump mid range paladin or control warrior out of tier two right now. Not with what's at the top of the ladder. Mm, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I'll probably get blasted for this. I don't think control priest is really the ninth best deck right now. I think it's. I think it's a little complicated to play and really dependent on your removal. And I don't know. I could see that getting bumped, moving everything up. I don't know, every time I play against it, I get beat. Well, it's super good against Paladin, right? Which is how it got as high as it is right now, is it just wins against Paladin. It's also actually uh, an unfavored matchup for mid-range Druid. So in theory, it should be a great deck right now, but Warlock uh, just eats it for breakfast, and it can't beat, like, Freeze Mage at all, ever. So it's tough. Like That's what I, I was don't saying. Know. Uh, like, I get beat by it every, almost every time I play by play, basically mid-range Druid. It's one of those super binary decks, right? It's, it, to me, it's the same as Freeze Mage, where it's like when you win, you win authoritatively, and when you queue into a deck that has a strong counter to you, you lose by turn four because you just yeah. there's nothing you can do. Like yeah. that's how you feel in any game that involves Priest or uh, Freeze Mage right now. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be like that'd be the only thing that I was just kind of like, huh? That's really interesting to see that down there. Um. I think this is the first week that I really agree with their list. I mean, overall, I, I think it's a great... Yeah. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Am I missing this? Is there... Oh, there's Midrange Hunter. Never mind. I would say Midrange Hunter isn't an awful deck either right now. I mean, it's not bad, but there's just too many things that get around its ability to try to dictate tempo, right? It's... I don't think it's... Hunter's in a rough spot right now, and I don't know how long it's going to be before it comes back, because it needs... It needs help, really. Um... It didn't really well get any help Druid. this last year because it was such a high tier deck that it didn't need help. Now that all, everything else has come out and, ma- and has become better, Hunter's just like, I suck now. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, like with Druid coming back, like mid range Hunter has always done well against Druid. Like any yeah, deck and that it can put a, mage generally. Right? Like any deck as mid range Hunter, any deck or really as. Midrange Druid, sorry. Any deck that can put two or three minions on the board with more than one health, like, you really can't beat if they get those out too early. Like, you have to have ways to remove those because then your removal stinks and they get favorable trades and then you're done. So, all right, though. Overall, Tempest Storm, bravo. We're, I think we're really happy. good. Yeah. Really good. Little, little uh, golf clap. The little, uh, the little yeah. golf clap. Yeah. You got Thank it. You. <laughs> hey, you know, I haven't got to use that button probably in like 25 episodes, quite probably because it's like five while. seconds too long. <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> it just like keeps clip it, clip it, clip it. We clap all uh, the way till that ball is all the way in the hole, and then we can stop. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you? Well, we're gonna be playing Tempo Mage after the show, so we're gonna let you know how we go through Tempo Mage. But uh, we should probably get into some emails, yeah. Yeah. We've got mail. So we definitely do. So um, emails, send us your emails to wellmet at blizzpro.com. Uh, we get we had a lot of emails. We really had oh to be God, it's so much email. This we week. had to be really judicious in the emails that we chose for this week. But keep them coming. They're great. Also, if you can keep them short, because uh, if, if the, the longer ones, even if they're good, they don't get chosen over the shorter ones if I can't prune them down easily. So uh, try to make them as short as possible, or even like send me a long one, or then like a short TLDR version that I can throw in that we can read on the show, um, so we can do that. But let's go ahead and talk through some of these emails. Uh, Kevin, sorry, Kevin, do you want to take uh, this email from Chris? Yeah, absolutely. So Chris writes in. He says, "How many hours past rank five need to be invested into the game to hit legend?" 
Uh, before I go any further, Chris, there's lots of good math on this. You can look it up all over the place on like Reddit and elsewhere, but we're going to talk about it in a second, but for sure, Google it because it's definitely out there. He says, I've read from rank five to legend can take 200 games. I hope not wins because expletive expletive, uh, has that been your experience as well? Is it possible with today's meta? If you're only able to play two to four hours a day tops with no longer playtime blocks. Uh, so Chris, absolutely. It is. Um, that number is not wrong by any stretch. 200 games to get from rank five to legend is definitely representative of somebody with like a good, but not great win ratio. Like that's probably in like the 56, 57% range, which is still actually pretty competitive. Um, but you got to win more than you lose, right? So this is like rank five to legend is definitely the time where if you're not totally averse to it, like I am, uh, trackers are really good for this because you can keep track of whether you're net positive over a long period of time. I mean, it's pretty obvious from your rank, but it's something worth keeping an eye on, like statistically. Um, but 200 games is not unrealistic at all. Um, and 200 games, I mean, that might take you 40 hours. Depends on how long your games go, I guess. So you might be looking at needing to play, you know, for those couple three hours you've got a day for two or three weeks to pull it off. Um, but it's very doable. Like I would say if, if your only concern is just the raw time factor, then absolutely. As long as you can play a good game and win more than you lose, definitely doable. Um, guys, did I miss anything? No, I just wanted to say like, if you're only able to play two to four hours a day tops like that, that's really plenty of time. Uh, that's lots. Yeah. You have more time than I do to play, to be honest. And, uh, I, I like, I'm looking at maybe an hour tops myself. Um, and I was able to hit it one month. Now I will say it's very difficult because of that, because of that constraint, uh, to do that. Um, but it, it, a lot of it depends on how efficient you are, uh, with the deck, how well, you know, the deck, how, you know, especially getting to rank five as quickly as possible is pretty important. And if you can get hit there like pretty early in the month, and then you have all that time to invest trying to hit those 200 games or 150 to 200 games that you're going to need to probably hit legend. Yeah. And to be fair, right, like all three of us have done this now, and I think we can all say with with pretty uh, objective uh, perspectives on this, once you've tried you're not going to want to try again for a while, whether you make it or not. Like if you push hard and you put in those hundreds of games and extra hours for a month, take the next month off, like relax, get away from the game a little bit because unless you're trying to play professionally, unless you're trying to like make money off of Hearthstone, trying to make that grind happen every month is totally nuts. It's a huge time commitment. It's a lot of work. Even for people who are super good at the game, it's just like like the, the pros who are like, oh yeah, it's day two of the season, I hit legend. Well, yeah, because they put in those two to four hours a day that you would put in over the course of three weeks in the first 48 hours like it, it is just a raw time problem and putting in that time every month will slowly like it, it'll eviscerate your soul you will have no will to play hearthstone left cool so I, i'm going to give you a little bit more of a mathematical answer to that because i love math math is great and math is awesome so once Even though you, you get made to rank five math joke earlier you totally well, did because it was stupid but uh, <laughs> okay so wow. um, if you want to get from rank five to legend, um, it, you would need a 56% win rate to do that in roughly 200 games, 203 games to I be said. exact. Right? No, no, I'm getting there, though. If, on average, a regular game is seven and a half minutes, right? So that you're talking basically 26.66 hours, right? So that's 26 and a half hours. Uh, if you have an average game of seven and a half, um, if it's ten, then you're you know you're talking what is that two hundred? What am I doing? No, that's not right. Anyways, that first that first part of the math is right. I, I can't do now and talk. I can't do the calculator and talk. But ultimately, you're probably looking at you know twenty five to thirty hours at a fifty. That's a 56% win rate in 200 games. Um, obviously, if you have a higher win rate, it's less. Like a 60% win rate, that's usually like my goal going, making that climb to legend. That's 147 games. Um, so something to keep in mind there. Uh, either choose fast decks or choose decks that you'd know well. If you choose slow decks that you don't know well, no, you will not hit legend. But... Uh, if you choose one or the other, you'll have a really good chance to do that. You never know. You might hit that lightning in the bottle because that's what I feel like I did. 
because I hit it like really, really early in the season. But uh, at the time, Agro Druid was still not very well known, and uh, I was playing it very, very well. And I probably had a seventy percent higher win or a higher win rate at rank five with it. And that's why I was able to get up so quick. Yeah, I would say the same thing about my first Legend Climb. I, I was running that super fast mid-range Druid style that ran all the extra charge minions. And, like, I, I did it in one night from 5 to Legend. Like, I just sat down and played for six hours and got there. So I clearly had a phenomenal win rate. I didn't have to suffer my way through 30 hours of 56%. Like, I I won probably 80-plus percent to finish it that fast. Um, that's not going to be the typical experience. And my mid-range Paladin Climb was a lot more like win three lose one win two lose one win two lose one back and forth for a much longer period of time yeah and well and something too like for mine since we're telling about our personal experiences i did it with the most autopilot deck secret paladin so i'm no one special but i did it um and i did it in about 180 games uh which according to this here probably is about right um i had about a probably about a 66 to 68 percent win rate um, so if you can keep that win rate high, it's, it's actually pretty quick and easy and it's really fun and it's a breeze. Uh, if you can't keep that win rate, it's, it's like just the sludgiest of belchers to go through. So you've got to really go ahead and do it. Like <laughs> oh you got to set goals. Like honestly, somebody in the chat, uh, I want to make sure I say that, uh, troll T G H S said set goals every you know day or week or whatever that increment of hearthstone that you play is so that you can do your best to do that life coach sets goals every week and then he reviews it with chat for like an hour afterward did we get it did we not how do we do it the guy life like like life coach is not too good to set weekly goals either are any of us so um, and, do that and don't be kevin learn from my mistakes when you start losing stop playing don't lose 15 consecutive games and bomb your rank. Just walk away. Like, if you lose three, stop. Just when you start stop. tilting, when you start tilting, stop. Three losses, I guarantee. After three straight losses, you are on tilt. I'm stop totally different. Walk away, I'm totally break. different. I can, I can lose three. I can lose five. I can lose six. That's okay. John's it's a robot. Quick. Don't listen to him. But sometimes, <laughs> like, games, sometimes I can't away. lose one. Like, you all, you know that one really devastating loss? Like, Sometimes that could be more tilting than three losses where they had great curves or you didn't play optimally and you know it. Like, I don't get tilted from that. I get tilted when I know I screwed up or my opponent didn't de deserve to win and they did win. Uh, you know, they top deck. Like, I had a guy the other night who top deck swipe into swipe. Um, I, I had eight left and I was controlling the board. And I can't remember what was happening, but I just couldn't get damage on him. I was really close. And then he top decked a swipe as his only card and then top decked the next swipe. Like those things, I'm totally tilted and I'm done. But then like I get outplayed because I'm playing against a bad matchup and I had a bad mulligan. Like, uh, you know, whatever. Life goes on. When I start cussing at the screen, that's usually when I know I need to Oh, I can't away. play at all then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if if you couldn't stay composed with your grandmother sitting right next to you, that's when you're tilted and you need to stop. I guess. I don't know. Let's go into this next email. Hope that helped, Chris. Uh, this next one from Peter G. Uh, it goes, Hey, well met, guys. Liquid Hearth had a recent article which discussed some advanced consideration and plays for mid-range Druid. Given that you are all fairly successful players... <laughs> don't laugh at that. <laughs> I want that laugh on a button. Uh, given hey, that, remember you're, you're talking to the potential player, the most player of the year. Given that you guys all sound like you're fairly successful players, how do you reach these high levels of effectiveness with a given deck? Gaining experience is an important component, but what other resources do you use to improve your play? Thanks for all the great work on the podcast, Peter. Okay, so we're going to take this two at a time. Uh, first of all. How, basically, how do you learn a deck and get to a point of proficiency with it? Kevin. 
I mean, I think it's I think it's probably probably a little bit of three different things, right? Part of it is definitely just experience playing with a deck. So if you find a deck that you begin to understand and you know what cards are left in it without having to actually like track it or look at a list, like when you know what you're waiting for and what you're going to draw to pull out and play with, that's a really good sign. Um, I would say when you learn how to tech it yourself is a huge one for me. Um, I find that when I'm learning a new class, like I've been trying to learn Temple Mage, uh, I, I can't go in and just make substitutions because I don't really have a good enough sense of where I can make cuts and substitutions effectively because I just haven't got enough experience with the deck. I've maybe only won like 300 games with Mage. Um, and, and that's not a small number, but that's across all the Mage I've ever played. It's not just Temple Mage. Uh, whereas like I, I would say the classes I've gotten to gold, I've generally played a, one or two archetypes in those classes to a point where I can go in and say, okay, I'm going to play Control Warrior today, but I know that the ladder is going to be super heavy on XYZ thing. Right now there's a lot of Druid. I'm going to sub Bomb Lobber in on 5 because I want to be able to deal with uh, Shade and Axe Ramus when I don't have any other way to clear the board. And that's that's the kind of stuff that I can do in a deck that I've actually played well. Um, and then the third part is definitely just getting to a point where you understand which matches you're going to lose. Because that's a huge part right now, I think, of knowing how to play against a meta is it you need to know as the archetype you're playing which masses which matches are bad for you it took me a really long time to do that when i first started playing like i was 100 percent convinced that control warrior should beat handlock 10 times out of 10 it just made sense and the more i played the more i realized like this is not a favored matchup for me it might split pretty evenly but this is not a favored matchup for me and and that's something you have to get a grip on is which classes and which archetypes within those classes are going to beat you more often than not that would be the three for me what about you, JR? I think one of the biggest things for me is uh, actually, you know, just experiencing the deck, getting in a lot of games with it, figuring out what's right and wrong with it. The other thing is playing other decks to learn what they do so that when you're playing your the deck you want to learn, that way you're going in knowing kind of what to do against these other decks because you've experienced them as well and know, you know, what, what you're coming up against. Um, like I had a lot of issues uh, playing against Handlock for a long time with uh, uh, mid-range Druid, so I just started playing Handlock for a while and uh, learning the ins and outs of it, and then went back to my mid-range Druid and got a lot better against that that kind of deck. So if you're hitting the, your head against a style of deck that you're not playing against very well, that would be also be my suggestion: is just playing it for a bit and kind of figure out the ins and outs, and then uh, using that experience uh, against it when you play play your uh, mid-range druid john what did we miss um i mean the only thing else that i would really just say and iterate on is knowing how your deck interacts against others is super important which is why secret paladin is so easy to play um because it doesn't (laughs) like it really it very little matters what your opponent's gonna play on the next turn it just really does because it just plays so well. Your minions are so strong. Um, it's like for me knowing really well that, oh, I can overload the board as much as I want really against mid-range druid because all he's got is a wimpy swipe. Um, it's knowing that uh, you can play, you know, what one and two drops to play against a mid-range hunter because you know that um, they don't have any one or two drops with charge. So whatever you say, you know, whatever you play is going to survive the next turn. Those types of things are super important. So no, I'm just reiterating what you guys are saying. Um, but th- I think that's, you know, the big, the big piece there. The next piece, um, about it is, is, uh, gaining experience is an important component, but what other resources do you use to improve you play? Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer this part first streams. I'm all about streams, live streams. I learned, I literally picked up Hearthstone with no experience, but just watching streams, and it made my transition so much easier. So find, you know, if you want to know how to play Warrior really well, watch show. Watch um, those guys who are really, you know, profound Warrior players. Um, Other things like that, uh, it would do, and play with friends, do. Like, Kevin and I, we argue the whole time we play together, but at the same time, like, we're both becoming better players because of it, because we're getting fresh perspective uh, whenever we're playing. What else? Oh, besides the cool subreddits and this podcast. 
You just took away the ones I was going to say. No, no. Uh, there's there's a really good subreddit out there, uh, competitive HS, uh, reddit.com slash r slash competitive HS. Um, I read that one a lot actually because they really go into like deck details and things like that. Uh, if, if you're on, uh, uh, if you really like the Hearthstone subreddit, then ignore it and go to the competitive HS subreddit because it's far superior in quality, in my opinion. Uh, Hearthstone's okay, but if they're not going on their little witch hunt every week, um, I, I also uh, I would just read like different deck guides and things like that. I know uh, Blues Pro tries to put one out uh, deck of the week every week, but there's a couple other sites out there like Hearthpone and uh, Hearthhead, which uh, have really good guides out there. And uh, just you know, go and read all you want about that. I'm not much of a live stream watcher. I'm more of I would rather sit down and play and get my experience that way or when I have some free time at work or whatever, sit down and read some things. Kev? I mean, I think you guys hit the nail on the head for the most part. I would say kind of to JR's earlier point, the most important thing, honestly, is having a good sense of what's going to be out there on the ladder. Like look at the community subreddits, look at the meta reports, learn through every available resource what you're going to be playing against because the decision making once you understand a deck like once you know the fundamentals in and out you know your win conditions you know how long your average game is going to go you know which matchups based on class you want to be the beat down in all those kinds of things you also need to know like okay i'm going to be seeing a lot of tempo mage today tempo mage right now is running ragnaros so i need to have removal queued up and ready for when ragnaros comes out if i don't have bgh in my deck and i have no other removal ready when rag drops i'm going to be in a lot of trouble and you learn those things by keeping sort of the pulse of what's happening in the game if you're not up to speed on that stuff it can be really hard because as fast as even a couple of days right like over the course of the weekend you're doing other things you come back you want to play some hearthstone on a monday Stuff has changed. Decks have mixed around, right? Midrange Druid is up at the top now where it used to be 14 flavors of Paladin. You have to make adjustments to reflect that. Maybe you've been teching Harrison Jones to deal with True Silver Champion. That slot probably needs to be a low theb now and you need to be thinking about when to play it. That kind of stuff, even with all the experience in the world, you're not going to get by knowing how to play a deck well. You're going to get it by knowing what's happening today now and you can play thousands of games or you can go look at the resources available, see what's happening and take that experience and use it as your own. Something I would say too, I I missed the first time. If you have a little extra income, uh, hire a coach. Like honestly, there are some incredible players. Like I got lucky when Freshco was just getting big. Uh, I paid like $15 an hour for like one of the top 30 gosu gamers players in the world to coach me through this thing and now he's like a close personal friend too which is really amazing you'll build relationships through that too and now anytime i send him a screenshot i'll be like dude what would have been the right play on this here's what i've played so far blah 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 and he helped me dissect a move here and there um stuff like that so if you've got a little bit extra like there are some really great players you know a really good player is typically going to start at like $30 an hour, but even someone who's been multiple legend, um, you can go ahead and check them out and 10 to 15 bucks an hour. I know Alec from Golden Wisp, he hits uh, legend every month and uh, he does free coaching if you just ask and they do it as part of like their post show stuff. So, you know, go check those things out and even come hang out with us. Like we'll we'll hang out and play some games too, whatever. Yeah, and all the time I've been playing any kind of competitive game, I I kick myself constantly that I didn't take advantage of better coaching when I was trying to be really competitive playing StarCraft. Like, I was trying to break into Master's League, which is top 2% in the world. I just should have gone and said, like, okay, this is beyond me. I've played thousands of games. I've put in hundreds of hours, and I'm not getting better. I'm kind of stuck. Whereas in Hearthstone, I did. I kind of broke through on my own, and I learned a lot by spending a lot of time with the game. And, And I think I have a better mechanical sense for the slower pace and the analysis that it's needed to be good at hearthstone but even still like i would have gotten where i am much faster had i sat down with someone better than me who was more familiar with the game or just a a smarter person than i am because lord knows there's lots of those and been like hey what am i doing wrong how can i improve what mistakes did i make in that last game and 
honestly, sometimes it's not even about finding someone who's better than you. It's just finding a second set of eyes. When John and yep. I sit and we do this on stream, it's like, I'll see a play he didn't, or I'll, I'll think of something in terms of like order of triggering secrets that he didn't to that exact second. And it's not that he couldn't have thought of it or wouldn't think of it, but like, why is it always it just helps? It's more the other way around. Really? You're always playing and I'm always having a call because you don't let me play. This relationship is very one sided. You can. Pl- oh, are you kidding me? You give it. <laughs> we're going to, we could fight about this later. We, right. could, we could go about this later. Uh, I love this. But for so, sure, coaching is a great idea. Yeah, for sure. I love coaching. I'm all about it. I like, honestly, if I don't understand something, I'll hire a coach for an hour because they'll teach me in an hour what it would take me 15 hours to learn myself. To learn on your own. Yeah. And I, I don't have the luxury of time with Hearthstone, so I need to be really efficient. So, you know, getting, I think. You know, for me, I think I hit legend after like 1,200 Hearthstone wins or something like that. Like, I could not have done that without coaching and a easy to pilot deck like Secret Paladin. Not saying it's anything amazing, but, you know. It, and in fairness, it like coaching is kind of a trickle down thing, right? Like, I can coach players myself who are not legend caliber players, right? Like, I, I'm not going to be the best coach in the world. I would rather that you get a pro player coach, but there's only so many of them and they are tough to get to. If you want to learn to play at a good, but not pro level, like I can teach people how to play at a good, but not pro level. And it's good for you to take advantage of that because honestly, if everybody tries to go to the pros, eventually there's no pros left and they're out of time. So sooner or later, it does have to start to trickle down and you do have to just reach out to, if you know somebody who hits rank five every month and you can't get that far, talk to that person because they know something you don't, or they've spent more time on the game or they're more familiar with the deck. And there's probably something you can learn from them. Maybe not a lot, but a little. Yes, that's it. That's how you do it. That's how you get to legend. That's how you do all your stuff. Cool. Cool. Woo. Guys, we gotta get out of here. <laughs> I couldn't find the button. Uh, thank you guys so much Woo. for hanging out during Did the it. show. Um, I know. I was just like, uh, I, was, I knew I was gonna hit the wrong one. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out for the show. Remember, we're gonna be hanging out and playing some Tempo Mage after if you wanna hang out. Otherwise, uh, check it on the live stream. Uh, we probably won't make a. We had a couple people ask if we'd ever make like a podcast feed of our games. Probably not, but we'll pray about it i guess i don't know you're gonna like, have to go on youtube because trying to do any kind of video podcast is very very expensive right it would be they asked for the audio yeah so like just yeah. doing an audio version but then we would have to talk too much yeah. uh we already talked about but anyways maybe down the line or something like that anyways we got some new patreon stuff going on don't we kev we sure do. So big news, honestly, on the Patreon front this week. We are working on maybe making some last-minute updates to a couple of our reward tiers that we're not totally satisfied with. You can check out the new reward tiers at patreon.com slash wellmetpodcast. Give us your feedback. Tell us if there's something you love, hate, want to see done differently. Um, spoiler, we are probably going to change one of them. I won't tell you which because we're still working on it. Um, but this week, a couple of big things. Uh, number one, we did crack our $300 a month Patreon goal. So we're going to do call-in episodes. I know John is hard at work on the tech to make that happen. We haven't exactly ironed out the details of like frequency, but it's something we're really excited to do. You guys owe me. Yeah, it is sure not do. easy. Okay. I believe I've, you. So I've built you a exciting. fortress of just amazingness. Just recognize because holy cow, it's going to be hard well, to do this. Cool. Now do call-in shows. Call-in shows are going to be great. Okay. So, that's that's number one uh number two we got two brand new patrons this week so thank you very much to eric c and martin Z. that's how we say that letter here in canada uh third and finally uh i wanted to give a special shout out to we got three patrons who according to the we. patreon site we uh, wanted I, to we, give a we, we sure, sorry we Jeez. want to give a special shout out to uh three of our patrons According to the Patreon site, they've been supporting us at an extraordinary level uh, for over six months. So basically since we started having a Patreon campaign at all. So to Terry, Albert, and Mark Petz, the three of you have been really, really strong supporters of the show for a very long time. Guys, we could not do this without you. Thank you so much. That means the world to us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. We love you. We wouldn't... I don't even know. All the warm feels in your general direction. There you go. Uh, let's go ahead and do iTunes reviews. Uh, Kev, I'm going to let you off the leash this week. Um, Such a gentleman. This is this is your strike too, though. So, uh, JR, give us the review for this week. Yeah, so this week we had one review from 
uh, in the USA from DVK777. Thanks so much for the review. And if you guys want to give another iTunes, uh, an iTunes review, head out to iTunes, do a little search on podcast for Hearthstone. Look for Well Met. Click on that. Click the little five star if you think we're worth five stars. Give an awesome little review, and we'll read it there every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's do some shout outs this week. Uh, what do you guys got going on this week? Any last minute shout outs, Kev? Uh, well, I mean, my life changed pretty big this week. Uh, I accepted a new job, uh, so I'm going to work full time for a salary in esports officially starting in February, which is pretty pretty unbelievable. Um, I'm not gonna spill more details than that yet because it's not 100% set in stone, but I'm stoked. Like I'm jacked beyond all belief. So that's a pretty crazy change in my life. Um, yeah, I'm still going to be writing, doing all sorts of other projects. It's not going to affect my ability to do the podcast or anything else. So I will see you guys here every week. I'll just be a little bit more tuned in to the crazy world that is esports. Awesome, man. Congrats. I can't wait to hear more. What about you, JR? I'm going to give a special shout out because they've already had a shout out. But I'm going to give them another one to Terry Albert and Mark Pett for being awesome Patreons the last six months. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to Martin Z, uh, who not only was an awesome uh, uh, patron and is saying he's going to be for the next 12 months, also does awesome infographs on the uh, hearthstone.blizzpro.com. Uh, he's yeah. been doing a lot of stuff with the Discover mechanic. Uh, I think the one I just put up today from him was uh, the Ethereal Conjure. He actually goes down, breaks it all down, what's the good you know, cards that you can get from him, puts down the percentages and all that. It's great. Yeah, he does some amazing work. And uh, shout out to JR for hooking that up with him. So I know uh, Martin came to Blizzboro wanting to put these stuff together, and JR kind of got him with the graphics dude and helped him make it happen. So kudos to you, dude. Way to make that happen. Uh, As for me, no major shout outs. I got school starting up next week, so uh, pray for me because I can't do it. I can't do it. The last time. The last time you made us pray for you, it was way more significant. We were praying for you, like meeting Katie's parents or something important. This is just school. Yeah. You got this. You got Dude, this. five classes simultaneously working full time and putting up with you knuckleheads. Uh, it's a lot of work. That's a lot to do. And I got to make this call in thing work. So that's a lot of freaking work to do. But yeah. So uh, big shout out to there. Uh, shout out to Katie for being really patient with me and letting me do all that stuff. And yeah. Well, uh, I think that's going to go ahead and do it. Uh, big shout out first and foremost to Jake Buttono at jakebuttono.ca. Uh, he does all of our music. He does incredible work. He does it for the payload as well, which we are back. Ah, oh, that's a good thing, too. We're back on the payload. So uh, if you're getting back on the Overwatch hype train, come check out the payload Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, same place, twitch.tv slash blizzbro, or Friday on your streams, uh, or on your uh, podcast apps and stuff. Uh, Dread Scythe of Scythe Designs, happy birthday, dude. Um, it's his birthday today, so big happy birthday. He makes our yeah, stuff look happy great. Happy birthday, man. Send us an email, wellmet at blizzbro.com. Tweet us at wellmetpodcast. Find us on our subreddit at slash r slash wellmed podcast uh, patreon.com slash wellmed podcast itunes google podcast blah blah blah, blah everything else blah, 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 blah. we're done bye you can find john on twitter at kicked tripod and on twitch at twitch.tv forward slash kicked tripod you can find jr on twitter at eldorian and on twitch at twitch.tv forward slash blizz pro and you can find kevin on twitter at lack of realism and on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash Odin TV. Pro.com. Beyond Noob.